morning, everyone, and, and we've got Laura online with us this morning, um, who's in the UK today, um, so on the same timeline as us. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have Alex with us this morning. I'm going to let Alex introduce himself, but um, you, presumably you're going to talk about Ragged University as part of your introduction. Are you brilliant? Okay, thanks. I'm going to hand this straight over to you, Alex. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really humbled to be here because I love learning environments. I, I love people who are, who are thinking about how we learn because I think it's one of the, not, not just the things we do to, to achieve things in life. I think it's a social behaviour. It's something we do that enriches our lives and it's a part of what makes us happy. I run a project called Ragged University and this has, for the last 15 years, I learned from social traditions of learning, which I would argue every place in the world at every time has some tradition of social learning, free learning, where we share knowledge and we enjoy learning from each other. Um, and indeed, I learned about the, the ragged schools in Britain. And before free education, communities shared their knowledge and supported each other. And the government eventually went, oh, this is a good idea. <laughs> Why don't we, we do this as a, as a standard course? So Ragged University comes from this idea that each person is a unique and distinct body of knowledge accredited by their life experience and with a membership of one. And we organise uh, using available infrastructure and common technology. So our, the world is our curriculum. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure being drawn into other people's world. And uh, it's, it's through people's natural uh, passion that, that knowledge becomes animated. It, it lights everything up. It becomes you know, something that uh, may seem mundane from somebody who's, who's looking from the outside in becomes really exciting. Uh, I rem remember hearing about the history, what, what's in a brick? <laughs> And suddenly realizing from a story that, that Susan, Susan brought together uh, that, oh, wait a minute, there's all of these histories, traditions, heritages, there's, there's the geology, the, the world, the universe can be seen through the lens of a brick. <laughs> it's, a, it's an odd, odd place to start, but. Uh, yeah, uh, there's there's that um, uh, you know, to see the universe in a grain of sand, and I, I I'm inspired by well, education in in these ways. So uh, this this on on the screen is uh, the the website, and there, there's no editors; there are only authors. So everybody is welcome to do a talk. And everybody is welcome to write and share what they're passionate about. Um, and it, it, it's people are represented by their own words uh, and their own context. And just change a second for Laura, sorry. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you, you can find, find uh, a lot of what people have shared over the last 15 years on, on this website. And of course, today uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about my, my thoughts on technologies. And uh, you can see on the Ragged University YouTube channel the presentation I gave last year, the last, the, the, same, the people in the course. So rather than just repeat the same presentation, I wanted to rehearse some of the things from new angles and from from uh, different positions. So in this presentation, you can see how I uh, critically appraised Microsoft. Um, and as, as multinational companies, uh, I'm, uh, I think we should be critically thinking about how they're acting in the world and also 
thinking critically about what the technologies are doing in our lives. Are they creating value or, or are they actually um, creating dependencies? This isn't disconcerting, I'm just going to put this here. This is the same one as well. No, no, no worries. Well, I'm, I'm audio recording this because oh. everything I do, I try and make sure is free and available for everybody in the community to, uh, to learn from and also to, to reflect critically on what I'm sharing because I'm learning from other people pointing out what I'm not seeing. And that's one of the joys of uh, education, as I, as I understand it. Critical friends. Um, yes, okay, the sound's better now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine start, starting Ragged University in the community thinking, and I was so enamored with technology. I was like, yes, we'll technology the hell out of this. We'll, do, we'll use all of this and we'll do, do, do. And more and more, I started to realize, oh, there, there are certain problems with technology, certain, certain wishes and dreams of Silicon Valley, you know, with all these promises, these golden promises. As I started to take them out of my imaginary and into the real world, I started realizing, well, this isn't working so well. I started to understand things like, Conversation, uh, uh, the most primary of, of the educational technologies. So if we think about uh, Rabindranath Tagore, famous Indian uh, educator and polymath, he said, all I need is the shade of a tree to start my school. Uh, and that, that helped me st stop fixating on the, the fetishes of the, 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 oh, I want a, a super computer to, to, to make, uh, you know, virtual reality um, depiction of a forest. And let's just go into the forest. Uh, what, what's the difference between looking at an image of a forest and standing in the re reality? Well, the digital for me is uh, we're, we're, we're looking at the screen and there's only so much information we can find there. And if we take a, a square foot of the digital environment, you know, how much information is represented in there? And we take a square foot of anything outside. And I would, I would say what we've got in the real world is infinite information. We can zoom in and we find more information. And zoom in again, more information. And zoom in and find more information. And we can't do that in the digital. We zoom in and we lose information because there's nothing there. It's, it's a lossy environment. It's a compressed environment. These are ciphers of the real world. They're, and so, but yeah, it started me on a, uh, a, a journey of going, what is this doing? So I got, you know, invested my whole life in using a smartphone. Uh, and it, it was useful in certain ways. So I, I, I started to put everything, all parts of my life into a smartphone. And you can see this article is, is a result of my experimenting with going, Okay, so I will stop using the smartphone for a while and see whether you see what it's doing or not doing. And several years later, um, and, um, I don't have a phone at all. <laughs> and I know a lot of people go, oh, what? And I met, met, met uh, an educator and an artist last week. Uh, and I'd arranged to meet them in a certain place. And uh, they, they said, wait a minute, you've, you've not got a smartphone? You've not got, but that's really brave. How did you, and I said, well, I, we arranged to meet here at this time. And okay, you're 15 minutes late. Well, that's fine. I've been sitting and I've been thinking and I've been writing my notes. 
And they were blown away. Oh, wow. And I, I could go, I, I, I've still, this, this is a very long article about some of the things I've observed about being more present in the physical world, being more present in the relationship of a learner teacher, which, which is a, a dialogue where we're all learners and we're all teachers. Um, so uh, it is great to be uh, involved with a course that's thinking about the the sustainability, the the you know the effectiveness of technologies in education uh, and the ethics, because these these dreams of Silicon Valley have rolled out all over the world, and and they're they're largely unquestioned, um, like like the automobile, you know, the petrol engine at one point. Oh, this is great. We can get rid of horses. Uh, and now we've got so many cars. We, you know, they, they take up so much space in our world and they're producing so many illnesses. Um, are, you know, we should be reevaluating or, or thinking What's this adding or what's this taking? Uh, and there's an interesting expression called opportunity costs. Opportunity costs uh, discussed in, in economics. And, and economics, a view I, I, I prefer of economics is not this awful financialism that reduces everything to numbers, but it's understanding the functional relationships of the average everyday person in the average everyday business of life, you know, and, and it, it speaks of how you're managing your own home. Um, so, um, I'm going to... Alex, may I ask right at the start? Yes. Anybody's got any questions as a thought? Can we ask them on Yes, absolutely. I was just about to say that. So I, I'd much, much rather, you know, uh, I, I'm really keen to hear, like, what's going on in other people's worlds, other people's thoughts. That's, that's the, the rich environment, is the gestalt environment for, for me. So as I, if, if there's a question, if, if you think, uh, you know, if there's a problem with something I'm formulating, uh, if, if, if you'd just like me to uh, clarify something, just tell me. Uh, yeah, it, I, I, I much prefer the dialogue. Um, uh, so I, I, and I'll try to use some pictures here. There's um, the inside, they're non-linear ways of communicating. And for me, a lot of the, the way we have to, I have to, and we have to think about is, is what the, the, <coughs> the material realities of digital technologies are. Because um, I, I do websites, I do web development for, for people, and I've noticed a lot of people sort of go, oh, well, this is, it's, it's almost like an imaginary state. It's like fairies build this in, in fairy land, and it's, there's, there's no material cost. So I, I remind people, well, a website is based on you're creating information, and that information is stored on a computer somewhere else in the world. And so you have to, and that computer takes power, and eventually the physical components wear out and you're paying for, for technicians to, to run around these big places and one, hey, this, this computer is running, you know, wearing out and we're going to take this out of the rack and we're going to replace it with the new one. And the, those technicians have to work in very cold and very hot environments. And then you've got water to cool these spaces. 
and you've got all the physical infrastructure in between. So this information is being transmitted via cables, and then it's being uh, also communicated across wireless frequencies, electromagnetic frequencies. Um, and all of this takes material, uh, the materiality of silicon, you know, not all silicon is useful for silicon chip production. You've got uh, rare earth metals. And when you create data, you're using energy. You're using energy to store that data. And for every uh, kilo of carbon dioxide that's produced, a corresponding amount of disease causing pollutants is also produced into our environment. So it, it not only changes the, the gas composition of the earth, but it also um, introduces uh, carcinogens, substances that when we're exposed to them, uh, they, they affect our biology in ways that, that cause uh, illnesses like cancer. So that's my starting picture. That's what I think about in terms of data. And this, this fantasy of creating infinite data sets um, is, is a problem because it's all got a physical cost and ri ridiculous costs. You know, you, it's rather like uh, any, any material, we, we have to think about the, 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 how much is available and how those resources are renewable. So thinking about what technologies are useful to me and uh, what, are, what, what, are, uh, what technologies are educational. So I, I've been looking at the biology of our brain. And the, the, is everybody, anybody familiar with uh, neuroplasticity as a term? So, so this, this, this is described, uh, this is, this described a, a term from neurology where the, the nerves that make up our brain are responding to the inputs, the informational inputs we have from our environment. So as a, you know, we're, we were born as babies, we're exposed to all this information. As we're exposed to information, nerve cells are produced and connections between these nerves are, are made according to the stimulus they're given. So hence the natural nurture <laughs> that we give to infants is, oh, okay, well, at a certain point we, we help them uh, we stimulate them by going ba da 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 or ka ka, and we, you know, the the the, the informational environment determines the physical makeup of of the brain and the central nervous system. And the more information, the enriched environment, as Marion Cleves Diamond has done, lots of very interesting work on, um, determines how developed the brain becomes. And that's the, the essence I see of what education ha is functioning in terms of. Um, and when, when we s stop using parts of our brain, like, like muscles, if we, if we sit down and don't use muscles, the muscles atrophy, and that's the same with the brain. So what, what happens is a, a pr neural pruning happens. The connections disappear and the neurons eventually disappear. And thinking about uh, in later life, we're seeing an increase in um, things like dementia. And there, there's very interesting work on how uh, 
sensory and intellectual exercise can delay and counteract dementia in, in very tangible ways. Um, so I'm interested in the thinking about that in relation to our sociological habitats. We, we've grown up, we, we've co-evolved with very complex environments uh, for 200 million years, and that's all active in us. So what happens when you take a, a, a sentient organism out of the environment they've co-evolved with over 200 million years. The same sensory inputs aren't there. And, and so you get this neural pruning. And I'm wondering how relevant that is to, in relation to dementia. And there are controversial discussions around uh, IQ testing. So there's a lot of problems with IQ testing. <laughs> But there, there's, uh, there's a discussion on what the Flynn effect. So this, this scientist Flynn looks at aggregate scores of IQ and has shown that decade after decade, the, the, the trend in, in, in the, the, the cohorts that he has studied has been to go up and increase over time. But he revisited his work and found those same trends that he was looking at have been going down again. Now, I wonder, uh, one, about the validity of tests, <laughs> testing in this way, uh, you know, the, um, but two, I, I, I do wonder about how much we're losing in terms of our sociological habitat. And that's that enriched environment that keeps our brain healthy. So when I'm thinking about a tool, does a tool enrich my environment, enrich the what's going on in my brain? Does it cause more neurons to be stimulated, to be produced? Or does it, uh, and the connections into connections between uh, my neurons, does it extend my capabilities, my capacities to do things in the world? Or does it denude these, uh, these physical realities? Does, does my brain shrink as a result of using a tool? So I'm, I'm interested in this contrast between convenience and uh, uh, capability. So to, to, to bring this into a, a context, you know, I, I've chosen to use what, what makes me very happy in life, food. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it looks so delicious, doesn't it? And so there, I would argue that there's infinite complexity in this. And, and these culinary traditions and these social behaviours reach right back into the, the, the mists of time. And I would argue we, we can find the, the dawn of chemistry and physics, all maybe all our knowledge we can find in cooking. So what what's you know what what's the mental this mental stimulus model of making a meal to get food? Uh, and, and this is just some of the things that I cannot I cannot depict. I'm only creating a map of the territory. But you know What's the mental activity in deciding what to be? What am I going to cook? What are we going to cook? Uh, well, you've got a whole life to think about. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, you can even take the same recipe and do lots of variations on it. Um, you, you, that can stimulate you to find out a recipe that you've never done before. All sorts of complexity. 
you can go to the shops. And you go, oh, right, okay. Where, where do I go? And that, that complex task of going out in the world and being in an interactive and complex environment is doing a whole number of other things, including physical activity. And physical activity is very important for mental activity, your mental health. The selection of ingredients. Do I take this garlic or that garlic? You know, that pepper, oh, that's nice and ripe, or, you know. The, the interaction with the shopkeepers, you know, uh, the joy of going into a shop where you recognize somebody and they, they're really excited because they've just got a really good batch of this, or, or just, I don't, you know, the, the small exchanges in life. Um, these are all creating infinite richnesses. And you've got to travel back, back to, the, you know, home. And you've got to prepare the, the kitchen and ingredients, you know, because, you know, it's timing, it's sequence, it's order. So having things ready, you know, to, to, to assemble and sequence the ingredients to give a particular effect, outcome. Um, and, and that's the mystery of cooking. You can give the same ingredients and the same recipe to a hundred different people and you will get a hundred different, slightly different outcomes. And then the presentation for eating. So this, this is a, a small example of the complexity and effort that exercises the brain. And let's, let's make a contrast where, where I can use a different set of tools. I was just going to say it's interesting that you used this to depict the fact that we are slowly eroding our brains <laughs> through the use of technology because I just need to sit with my phone to decide what to eat. I don't need to go to the shops. I don't need to interact with anyone. I can select my ingredients on the phone. They'll be brought to me. I can request for them to be prepared, so pre-cut, whatever. I don't need to do that in the kitchen. All I need to do is check it in the pot and then maybe take it out. And even then, in the kitchen, I don't necessarily need to do it because there is tech to do it for me. <laughs> so what's left is me just plating my food and possibly sitting down and eating it. But even then, the joy of eating it is not, we're not experiencing it in its fullness because we've got the gadgets with us. Well, in, indeed, and you've, you've prefigured oh. the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. I can go, oh, well, I'm looking at a menu and I've got limited options, which is different from thinking, what shall I cook? Um, and on that limited option, you know, I, I, I select and I pay and the food arrives. What, what has been lost? Just thinking about the sociological denuding coming back to this, it's, it's, it's you've got at the one extreme choosing everything online and then you've got actually going to the supermarket with a bizarrely limited choice where you can't smell the garlic and then you've got going to a market you know which is outside which is has you, you go around you taste things you engage with things i don't know if you have markets like that in in china but I see them in France, I see them across Europe, and I don't see them here. Yeah. And there's, there's something about the richness of all of that food, which is entirely uh, missing in our sociologically, I love that term, denuded, which yeah. means everything's taken out. Mm. Um, so, you know, in some ways, and, and yes, we don't even get to speak to anybody in the supermarket because now we have machines. So in some ways, what's happening on, in a mobile, through a mobile de device is actually similar when you go to a supermarket these days. Yes. Which is interesting. 
But a, a supermarket is a desert compared to a, a street full of independent businesses, all of whom uh, create their, their personal networks and, you know, get tamarind from here because it's the best tamarind or, or you know, it, it's, it's infinitely more complex, the, the small businesses, uh, the, the vertically managed multinational company that has optimized for efficiency and streamlined. Um, it's an illusion of choice. And, and there's a nice exercise I do when I walk around the supermarket. I, I try and count on my hands how many products are created within a 50 mile radius. Now, now, I've never found, I've never filled two hands. Yeah. Uh, and this is a, an economic denudation. Uh, you know, it's a cultural denudation. Um, we find that the subsidiarity of small businesses employs more people. There are relationships. There are stories. It's a storied existence. Um, and a, a friend of mine, uh, Will Martin, pointed out, well, the, 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 there's a term called déraciné. It comes from the French uprooted. We're becoming uprooted from these long histories. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're complex history. And the, what's happening out in the world is happening to our neurology. And of course, education and the educational process is about enriching, enriching and extending the capacity, the natural, the inherent capabilities, uh, rather than replacing. So an artist might talk about a tool, the brush, as an extension of their being. You know? Now, what, what, there's a bit, big difference between that tool and a replacement of your capacity in the world. Because when the, that tool is no longer present, or there's no energy to run it, or it's glitching, what happens? Well, the activity itself doesn't happen. And these are forms of capture and dependency. And uh, they're invisible deserts. And, Susan's written some very interesting work on these invisible deserts we're, we're, we're living in in this, these modern times. At least, you know, my experience of, of being in Britain, I've, I've experienced lots of invisible deserts. Oh, I want, I'd, I'd love to have lunch. Oh, I can only find one of these awful sandwiches. <laughs> you know, I, you know, there, there's <laughs> that's just, just university. So you, this, this I hope sh shows a little bit about how I'm thinking about the tools you know, and software, computers being uh, tools within our lives. So I'm going to try and just sort of share a bit what, what what goes on in my world when I'm. Now picking, you know, what what tools am I going to adopt? What am I? And when I'm adopting a tool, I'm giving it space in my life. It's taking up real estate, time, cognitive space. And when I give space over to this tool, other tools are not getting space. So again, back to this concept of opportunity costs and I've become more and more aware and wary about what what I'm instituting in my life how am I, you know are, are these tools creating dependencies um, that as soon as I become uh, I lose capacity when they're not there I become fragile in the world. An example is a calculator doing 
basic mental arithmetic, being able to count the change I've been given or work out, uh, you know, I've, I've given this much money, I should have got this much money in return. Now, what happens when I've not got the ability to, to put in the information and get a response? Well, there's neural pruning that's gone on. There's a bit of my brain that's no longer there, like a muscle. And I, I used to be able to do press-ups. Uh, this is a lie. <laughs> you know, if I, you know, it's, you know, when you stop, Doing, if you know, I do a lot of walking. I've got a good set of leg muscles, and so when there's the, a, a bus isn't there, I can walk across town. And I, I've met people who are shocked, shocked that I'm I'm walking in urban environments. They're used to getting taxis or or, or driving, it, and that that's another example. You see all the world. When you walk through a, a, a physical space, you see all the world, you encounter the world, and you experience serendipity. And serendipity is a magical ingredient. It's a mysterious thing that takes us into new ways of seeing, new ways of understanding. So when I'm thinking about... Uh, adopting a, a, a new tool, I think, about ownership, reputation. And the, the links aren't, you can't see here, but I, you know, I mean, I'm writing a, 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 an accompanying deep dive blog to go with this presentation. Um, these, the, this is an analysis of Apple, because we get all of these wonderful visions projected out of the world. Apple, we're, we're caring, we're privacy conscious. We look, we look after the environment. These are safe tools. Oh, okay. I, I, I think the legal system is very interesting because you get to see when the legal system has had to adjudicate on things that have been against the law, you know? And you can see how many times, you know, often a company has been sued, prosecuted for breaking laws, how many fines they've been paying. And, and Apple has a, a number of great problems associated with it. It's not as environmentally friendly as, as it's suggested. In fact, it's, I would say at various points committed environmental crimes. Uh, the forced redundancy, the, the lack of the ability to fix the phones, to upgrade the systems. Um, you know, you've got reports given, uh, done by uh, organizations like Friends of the Earth. Now this, this report is hard to find now, but there's a wonderful tool you can use called the Wayback Machine. If you're ever looking for a report and you get error not found, yeah, you, know, up, you can take that URL and you can go into the Wayback Machine and you can put it in there and it will show you a picture of that. And you can often get reports that have been buried or, or gone missing. Um, so this is a glimpse, and, and, and this, this would supplement what, what you can see in my la last year's presentation, where I scrutinized Microsoft, for example. And uh, Microsoft, um, an example of the problems of, uh, associated with Microsoft, Germany has recently banned Office 365 in its schools because it's expropriating the data of, of, of the people using it. And so as a country, it went, no, we're, we're banning this tool, this digital tool. So it's, a, it's an insight into problematizing. Apple phones 
are now uh, the iPhone 12. Has you, have you heard about how it was recalled across the nation of France because the electromagnetic magnetic radiation is, is so problematic. Um, and, and we've got cases like um, in the, the education, the doorstepping of, of universities, educational institutions. You've got salespeople turning up in places like Los Angeles district and going, hey, if you just buy into this scheme of giving an iPad to every kid, well, these iPads do all this education stuff. And, and that has been a spiraling cost to over one billion pounds for that district. <laughs> it's been a complete white elephant. And it, it's under, it's eroded the understanding of that dialogical relationship. So education is not the, biz, the, the buildings or the tools, the relationships that are going on between the teacher and the learner, which are dialogical. And to, to go, here's an iPad. And then we can do away with people. Hey, you know, let's just make a book. It's, it's disastrously fragile, I would argue. So for me, I look at the owner reputation. This technology, uh, what, what are the public problems that have been reported on? I look at. Another aspect I look at is uh, the, the cost barriers to using the tool. Am I paying rent? Uh, do I own my own product? Is the freemium version sufficiently useful for me to, to understand the, you know, whether this is going to be helpful in my context or not? Does it require me buying other things? Uh, does the company have unstable ownership? Is this, is this basically an investment vehicle that's being passed around and the conditions change? You know, so I, I bought into this tool. I went, yeah, you can have my information. And they were great people. And then it was bought over. And then the next company is gone. <laughs> well, that, that agreement you made with the, the different owners. And there's an interesting case of this happening uh, in Australia, where uh, uh, an investment manager has been brought in to monetize a, a whole company. And they've basically taken 20 year old customers and gone, well, now you're paying for your email. And they go, well, but we all, all, you know, my, my life communications are on your servers. Yeah, well, that's a problem, isn't it? Have you got money? And this is playing out very badly. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the picture of the, 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 the colloquial expression of moving the goalposts has always been to indicate how terms of conditions what you expected is no more because somebody's changed things without telling you. There are right ways to change and there are unethical ways to change. Uh, does the cost exclude ex external uptake? So what, what do I mean by that? So I, I may be able to use a tool can the person I'm going to be working with use this tool? Well, I, I can use v virtual reality. You know, where I've got the headsets, I've got the fancy diz gizmos and all of that. Now, if, if I'm doing, uh, I'm, I'm not, by the way, I, I think VR is, uh, is absurd <laughs> in, in a, lot of, a lot of circumstances. There are case uses for it. But um, anyway, if, if I'm going into a community and going, oh, yeah, you, you 
we can all be, you can, we can do education here. You just have to have the, you know, the, the latest, greatest computer or a VR headset. And it, it, it's completely unrealistic. Um, so again, uh, uh, do, does, does it work across operating systems? So is this software tool, will it work on a new computer? Will it work on an older computer? Will it have backwards compatibility? If you produce something and it's only locked into this version of you know, this software, and softwares run on softwares run on softwares, I've, I've lost work. I've seen lots of people lose legacies of work because there's not this backwards compatibility and uh, uh, what, what the, the tool you've always been using is no longer working on new tool. So that... Yes, that, that, that is something that is little considered in a lot of universities. So we have Blackboard and you know they tell us the latest browsers we need, etc, um, etc. Et um, and they're always predicated on more and more, you know, you've got to use more and more bits, bytes to engage with what you're seeing, for example, in Blackboard. And the person who's working in an environment with very slow internet, because most of it is now online, you, you can no longer download. I remember when you used to be able to download the VOE, right? You can't, you can't do that anymore. So I suspect that there are lots of stories of people simply not being able to access some of the materials, materials we're engaging with because they haven't thought about backward compatibility and they're not even aware that that's a thing anymore. I think it's a very good point. I'm glad you mentioned backward compatibility. These are red flags for me uh, or green flags. Oh, this, this company has thought about this. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next part of my analysis. Because like with a lot of things, when a company or people do something well, you develop uh, uh, lots of respect and a, a sort of an impersonal friendliness. Yeah, you know, you, you like recommending it to other people. It's, oh, this is great. It does, does everything that I've wanted and it doesn't exploit my data or whatever. Uh, so, um, yeah, there aren't just red flags. These are also green flags. When, when people do it well, it's a joy. Uh, is the data exportable? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you've gone into this tool, you've made your work. Can you get it back out? Like this dog with a bone trying to get, you know, it, it doesn't fit, it doesn't go back out. Um, am I locked in? And this, this I've seen too many times over, over uh, the last 15 years. And you get, the, the, there's a lot of this comes from the, the fail fast culture. That's a quote from Silicon and Bar uh, Valley, where investors are pushing and pushing and pushing and going. Like, so you get all of these hopes and dreams and the marketplace is not there to nurture, not there to, to try and get the, the best possible outcome. It's looking for a high financial return and it causes things to become fragile and, and exploitative. You know, if I uh, look at, look at, uh, um, well, there's lots of, lots of examples where suddenly you find your, your, your work is, is no longer your own. Um, and, uh, absolute red flag for me. Even if it's a very attractive tool, I wait and I go, well, 
if I go, I'm going to spend all this time working in this space, will the company be around? Will the technology be around in 10 years? Uh, can I move it into uh, another tool that somebody else has because they've not paid for or, or not using and, and invested in, with my tool? It's a, it's a lot about collaboration. Uh, file type convertible. <laughs> Is the file type available and convertible? Hieroglyphics, beautiful language. Not very practical in this day and age. <laughs> uh, small hardware requirements. So if I'm going to put this tool onto my computer, is there room for anything else? <laughs> you know? um, and I. Uh, yeah, a really good software has a light food print. It, we, we, um, there, there has been this culture of upselling, upgrading. Now you need us. Uh, you know, we, we surpassed the computational power to run, uh, you know, expeditions into outer space many years ago. Do we really need the computational power that's being sold to us? No, no. Using the computational power well is the skill of the good designer, the good coder for me. And it also allows me to use multiple tools on, on my system. Uh, Opt-out metrics. Can I choose what data, you know, the, the software gathers? Can I opt out? And what transparency do they have? Um, and this, this is the major compulsion. There, there's an absolute fetishization of uh, the, the appropriation of data. Um, and we can see that by, you know, France, the French government, put an injunction on Microsoft saying, stop spying on our citizens. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm all right if I'm asked, can we have your information? And here's how you can choose you know, what information they're handing over. Um, it's a red flag for me when software is taken without that consideration, because it tells me something about how they regard other people. And when somebody has no regard for other people, that's one ethical violation. So what, what does that mean about their values in other areas? Are they quite happy to buy conflict minerals? Are they quite happy to externalize pollution? Um, uh, well, <laughs> I, I see some people with with value bases trying to embody good ethics in the world, and that extends to areas that they might not have thought about it yet. So they're on the learning curve. Oh, I, yeah, they might go, oh, I didn't think about that, but I am now thinking about it. And then there are other people who have decided to internalize a value base where they're going. Well, I'm not thinking about that because it, it's going to cost me. And so I'm going to leave that to other people to think about. So how much does that attitude extend to other things they do in life? I, I, I think it's sort of a pattern without being too cynical. <laughs> um, I want tools that are not on the cloud. There, there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's computer. <laughs> so would I store everything in an unaccountable company, you know, warehouse? Like, oh, well, yeah, of course. 
No. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the cloud as a notion has been so a way of selling um, wholesale ownership of people's lives. And if we look at companies, scandals like Cambridge Analytica, familiar? Right, so uh, these kind of companies have, have set out as their mission goal to take as much information, 5,000 data points on every single person. And they, they, they morally absconded, they morally decoupled. And the cloud is perfect, like VPNs. Which VPN? <laughs> So you're running all your all your digital interactions through this VPN. Yeah, well, they've got a perfect transactional record of everything you've done. Some VPNs are just selling that one to data brokers. Um, so back to company reputation. Stable ownership. <laughs> a company's values and products are about a stable as the people who are involved. The stock market is a moral and ethical disaster zone. Uh, investors can be aggressive, aggressive drivers of change to the original product. When people change, the product changes. And I've used an example of the innocent smoothie. Now, so these, these guys made delicious smoothie, take just fruit, liquidize it, let us drink it. Don't mess it, mess with it. Fruit's just pretty perfect itself. And everybody start, really started really enjoying these products and they got great reputation. And then Coca-Cola bought it. And from the surveying that I've done, like I, I certainly, the, I don't think it's the same quality of product. Um, and everybody I've asked has pretty much stopped, you know, buying instrument smoothie because something has changed. And we, we can think about this um, in, in all production values. There's, there's a story, I think it's about stinking bishop cheese. Uh, does anybody know Wallace and Gromit? <laughs> and a, a cartoon animation, very sweet, and very funny. The characters, uh, Wallace goes, ooh, jeez, ooh, lovely. Uh, and it was so, 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 so adorable that everybody started to buy the cheeses that Wallace was mentioning. Ooh, I like a bit of stinking bishop in the morning, Gromit. And so everybody was going, oh, I've got to try this. Ooh, Wensleydale, ooh. <laughs> and the sales just went, ooh. And there, I think it was that of Stinking Bishop. There was these investors who just turned up on the doorstep and we want you to make tons of this stuff. It's brilliant, it's delicious cheese. And, and the, the owner said, no. Said, but why were you going to get so much money? And he said, it changes the nature of the product. You cannot scale this up without changing the product. Uh, and these economies of scale uh, are, are relevant. And the, the, the forces, again, in the stock market, um, we, we need to examine the ownership and the, the, the drivers. Uh, I look for a product that's jargon free. <laughs> Now, what, what's jargon? It's a new, it's a technical language to dis, to fit a technical situation. So I've, I've come across a certain, and it's very sweet, I guess. And I guess lots of people develop a product and then want to create new words f for things that people are already have words for. So, um, uh, and it's, it's just confusing. It's just, I, I just 
bin these products because I go, well, where's the save button? Well, if somebody's changed it to a word that uh, uh, adds to perpetuity, well, why don't you just call it save? Everybody's using that language. I love said. <laughs> um, no intellectual property appropriation. Who owns the content? Create it. Uh, this is uh, uh, Facebook and Meta are, are examples, forerunners of this. Everything you put in there is owned by their company. And this, this is a, 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 an ethical problem. And as a result, I removed, I tried to remove my you know, ragged university from Facebook and I couldn't. Why? Because everything that was put on there had to stay on there because their, their ownership. Uh, hello? Come here. <laughs> um, so, so this uh, this I see is land grabbing, and it, it's a, in an example of a bad relationship between the, the the people who are creating these tools and the people who are using these tools. And when there's a bad personal relationship, there's there's unethical outcomes down the road I see it as. So you can uh, look at uh, the Wikipedia page, criticism of Facebook, and it's one of the biggest. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on and like, on. Oh. And they were using, you know, socially experimenting on people. Um, so I advise you to look at the criticism of Facebook. And when they started buying things like Snapchat, Instagram or, or, you know, or everything, yeah, these these value bases extend to all of their product range, and so as a result, I just went, no, I I can't in good conscience invite people into this environment, even if lots of people are using it, and they would go, oh well, but it's just. It's a community thing and you can keep in touch with people and it's like, yeah, well, they're, they're uh, exploiting people and they're doing lots of damaging things in the world. So, uh, come on, I've actually come off of uh, you know, Twitter, we call it X now. <laughs> I, uh, I, really, I mean, it's just gobsmacking how myopic and idiotic some rich people can be. Um, no data brokering. So this is sort of an information graphic that I grabbed. And I see this is one of the biggest sustainability problems we've got. So it, it, di it directly interfaces with um, uh, the ethics. Um, so you're t taking data from your user base and as an income stream you go, well we're going to sell this to a data broker and a data broker is aggregating that data set with other data sets and they're selling their data sets to other data brokers and there's all this internal market and aggregation and duplication and triplication of a lot of it's trash. Trash data, big data, poor data, subprime data. <laughs> um, is it useful? Well, the carbon footprint of this accruing amount of data information. Um, of questionable value. So if we test the quality of our air and our water and our environment, these are directly being changed in 
relation to the amount of data that's being produced. It's, so I've, I've been trying to chip into these uh, imaginary relationships between the, the digital world and, uh, and, and bring in the, the material understandings of, of this. And data brokering, it may, it's an attractive income stream for software developers, but it's a very problematic one. Uh, deletable accounts and files. <laughs> so, can I delete my account? Can I delete my content? Is it being used to pad net worth? So, are you is, is anybody familiar with unicorn businesses? <laughs> a unicorn business is a business, an investing term for private startup companies with a valuation of $1 billion or more. So uh, this fiction, these fictions of the investment world are producing all of this unicorn crap. <laughs> this, and, and what, you, what you've got, what, one of the ways you can pad your net worth is you say to investors, well, we've got this many users and you know, if 100 people enter the system and 75% never use it again, you could still twist the statistics and walk in with a you know, glitzy pitch deck and go, hey, we've got 5 million people using this. This is our net worth. So the investment world is filled with these imaginary pieces of nonsense that aren't even good for fertilizing roses. <laughs> <coughs> so the material costs of computing, I see, you know, broken down very simply. The hardware materials, I think about the repairability, the modularity, the upgradability. And software drives the hardware reality and vice versa. These are not uh, often imagined as different sectors, but um, what you've got is portfolio management and portfolio interactions. <coughs> so what I want to see is a circular economy and software tools that work on that circular economy, on the upgradability, on that, that ability to go, okay, I take this RAM chip out, I'm going to put this new RAM chip in. We're thinking about how it, it, it works without having to get a quantum computer. I'm sure we'll be sold that line relatively soon. Um, hardware longevity. So the hotter piece of hardware runs, the shorter it's life. Uh, the more stress you put it under, like any physical system, it will decay faster. So I want to see efficient use of the, the hardware. Um, <coughs> data is energy equals energy and hardware degradation. And energy is or equals carbon dioxide production and disease pollute, uh, producing pollutants. Uh, and the, the rise in uh, cancer across the world, because these are not lo localized effects. They're, they're most concentrated around the places of production, but it's a gaseous planet and these, these travel the globe. So companies have to think about their, their impact, about people all over the world uh, and, you know, certainly in their immediate environment because often the, 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 there are lots of toxins that are, are 
aggregated the closer the source of production. But it being a global industry, uh, it, it's now everywhere. Um, so I ask, is the software elegant code? Is it light on the processing power? Is it seasoned code? Uh, I have the glitch has been worked out. Uh, I, I like open source uh, communities because you get often better outcomes over time because there are more bug fixers. Lots of people chip in. And, and even sort of private enterprises, people like to bug fix because maybe they've got a good relationship with the firm and go, I found this bug. I'm a programmer. This is how you fix it. So you, so you get uh, shout outs from, from certain uh, developers going props to thanks for pointing this out and producing uh, the um, solution. And people get build whole careers on that. It's like, oh, I fixed the bug in that. Mm -hmm. And I got a shout out. And they can be respected in the community. So that ethical and virtuous relationship, e ecology relationships, I think ex uh, produces better products. Is it innovative code? Is it doing something better? Um, <laughs> so, this moves on to the moral disengagement problem, uh, and uh, I, I, has everybody seen Star Wars? Yes. <laughs> so, I've, I've got this, uh, uh, this the sort of exercise. If I worked in the canteen on the Death Star, mm -hmm. right? I can be standing there and going, I'm just washing dishes. I'm heating up sausage rolls. I'm not, you know, I don't really like Darth Vader. Okay, I'm working for the guy. It's, it's not ideal. And I do fun runs on the weekend. We raise money to go to the local charity. Yeah, but have you seen what you've just done to Thoth? You, you know, level, you've just destroyed the planet. Yeah, I know. So at what point do I morally disengage? At what point do I go, my morals, my values, my ethics? Well, I'm going to put those aside, um, you know, for £10,000, £100,000, a million pounds. Ooh, it's, it's all, you know, to improve the lives of your family, uh, to, to have less anxiety in life, to have, here's a good one, to have seed money to do good things in the world, <laughs> to get a good professional rep uh, reputation, you know, uh, oh, I built this, I sold it, it's made a load, um, oh, you're the person behind that. And, and that, that could be a strong attractor. I remember being at a Chamber of Commerce event and talking about um, socially responsible business. And there was this very rude investor who just looked at me and he said, rubbish, it's all rubbish. You make your money and then you do good. So one of my favorite films, and I think it's a parable of our times um, up here. This is David Bowie in uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Anybody seen it? 70s classic. So the story behind this is uh, this, this guy is an alien from a distant planet and the planet has run out of water. And uh, he, you know, he's got children, a partner, and his plan is to, well, they've got gold, all the gold they can eat. And so he designs a, a spacecraft to come to Earth that's got water, 
and he's going to bring water back to look, you know, save his family. And so he makes lots of gold rings, he puts them on the chain, and he travels to Earth, and he does amazing things with knowledge and technology, you know, invents the photographic industry, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a story of slow corruption and how his values change, how you become fatigued. Uh, and, and it's a, an ethical parable. You know, okay, I'm going to make loads of money now, any way I can. And then when I'm rich, I'm going to do lots of things like, you know, books for the community and, and spend it well. But the, the journey is as important as the ends. You know? So the, the Peter Singer paradigm, there's, there's a moral philosopher, an, eth uh, an ethicist called Peter Singer. I, I like his work. Um, so as a, as a software, as software designers, you may design a product, launch it as a free product. Venture capitalists will, you know, may ask you, how are you going to monetize it and feed your family and feed your cat? Uh, all very important to, to you, to us, to everybody. Do you use data brokering as an income stream? It is tempting. Um, uh, it may be designed for a handheld device. The more people use it, the more you get paid. What if you discover this is bad for people's health? At what point are the incentives sufficient for you to morally engage and cut off your income? Or alternatively, morally disengage. What, what, so what value bases, what values are, are we carrying around in our lives? Uh, I, I think Peter Singer's uh, work helpfully generates dialogues, discussions, because if we think about these things, we can act according to the value basis we choose rather than find ourselves ushered, you know, trapped or within. Which brings me to electromagnetic frequency pollution. Um, a new frontier uh, that, that um, I, I've been looking at over, over time. Now, at one time, uh, the simplest way I, I can express this. Uh, one time, going out in the sunshine, everybody went, oh, well, the sun, it's always been around, it's fine. But now we're told when you go out in the sunshine, you've got to protect yourself because there are health implications from too much exposure. For a long time, uh, the thoughts were that ionizing radiation, like x-rays, gamma rays, were that's the dangerous stuff. Non-ionizing radiation, that's safe. Now, in 1986, they set the safety li limits on the what, what's safe exposure for non-ionizing non radiation. Um, and it was never anticipated how many sources of electromagnetic frequency transmission would be, you know, if you'd gone back to 1986 and said, <laughs> everybody's going to have a mobile phone, possibly two, possibly several more devices that are, are transmitting. Some people are going to have fridges that are reading what's inside and transmitting information. Um, so, so the levels of, of this, these electromagnetic magnetic frequency were not anticipated. Um, and uh, for me, a very a key 
moment was when a very reserved medical journal called The Lancet published a large editorial from very established medical thinkers saying, we've, we've got to have a conversation about this. This is recent times. Because we, the, the evidence base is now coming in. It does affect our physiology. It negatively affects our physiology. And we've got people like Dr. Deborah Davis, you know, senior advisors around the world. Uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, uh, is one of the people who contributes to the United Nations reports on this. Uh, but also advises to the United States government. And she does a, a fantastic presentation uh, say, to the public saying the industry is marking its own homework. We've, we've got to have this conversation, so I'm now talking in public about this. Um, originally, telephone handsets were measured for their safety six inches away from grown adults' heads. Not, not next to the... So one of the things in her presentation she says is, if you do have a handset, a mobile phone handset, and you hold it next to your body, you have already exceeded your, the recommended daily, uh, safety guidelines that were set in 1986. So let's have a cool, calm analysis of this. If you've got your mobile phone, use a wired connection to talk on it. This is, this is not risk-free. And they're starting to bury warnings about the safety limits within the, the menu layers of the mobile phones themselves. Um, so this affects not just our physiology, but uh, we're, we're finding studies like bees are being affected in terms of their navigation, their behavior, their health, according to the, the electromagnetic frequencies that are, are around. So that, that takes, that's the last slide I've got. And I hope that's an interesting tour of the things that are going through my head in when I'm thinking about the technologies, uh, and particularly when I'm, I'm inviting other people into digital spaces and to adopt things into their lives. Um, there are good technologies. There are people who are working very ethically, very conscientiously. There are terrifically unethical businesses uh, and people who have just absconded morally. And there's a whole lot of people in between going, what the hell's happening? <laughs> um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be in a room with all of you who are thinking through this and not only thinking about useful tools to extend our capacities and capabilities, but also do it in such a way that uh, the sustainability questions are, are addressed and the ethics are addressed. I would argue that by doing this, you will garner the affections of people and a very strong following for any ethical, sustainable tool. It's a, it's a slow burn, but it's a solid one and it's a solid relationship that can weather fluctuations of stock markets because people will go, this is a richness in my life. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>
and you know, sort of give them a choice in a product that's ethical. I think Mark Zuckerberg would say people don't want that choice. We just want things to be easy. Yeah. And they don't want to meet the terms and conditions, not just because it's long and legal speak, but they just can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. And the amount of people we speak to who do say, yeah, I don't care, I just want to be able to use it. So how, how do we know that people will really want those, that they would, it would be more solid? I love that idea that it's, it's slow, but it's, and it's, it's more solid. Um. Yeah, well, that, that, that problem, a lot of people, yeah, this is convenient. Don't, don't give me the details. Oh, they can have my data. Uh, no, it, it's rather like an environment. Uh, uh, Dr. Deborah Davis was like, well, where are the cancers, where are the glioblastomas now? It's in 40 years' time. We, think we're th we have to think across our lifespan. Um, and generating a conversation with people about capacity, like the, the non-conscientious person, I find, is a victim of technology. They end up spending an awful lot more they end up going, oh, my computer's slow and, and it's not working as I want it. And they go along to a shop and they go, they, they get told, oh, well, you're going to have to buy this new faster computer. And then that new faster computer is just as slow as their older computer because it's just not working very well. Um, it's, who are you going to speak to? Um, and you, I think we have to choose who we're going to invest in. Um, Zuckerberg is, is denuding our mental capacity. That whole industrial complex is having, uh, bringing costs into everybody's lives. Are, are, we, are we fine with poor health? Are we fine with not being able to work out things when the tools he's given us don't work? Like, oh no, Facebook is gone. I'm so lonely in the world. I've not got, I've not got the confidence to leave my room. I've not got the confidence to say, let's, let's meet a group of strangers and talk have a, a, a lovely dinner together. What are the costs? Not just finance, the financial reductionism. We're in the financial world. Nicholas Shackson, very brilliant commentator on this, writes in his book, The Finance Curse. The finance curse, I would argue, is playing out in all areas of our lives because of these economic fictions of growth, perpetual growth. Uh, and, and it's convenient for Zuckerberg. But um, how, how enriched is his existence? I, I'm pretty sure he lives in a, a bu bubble that's very ostracized. It's, 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 does he know how life is or could be for the majority of the other people on earth. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is, it, there are short-term gains, gains and our economies, the global economy has been predicated on these fast extractions and those fast extractions call unstable economies and unstable products. Now, if you want to be a job hopper, uh, as uh, a friend who works in the business school, you're just going, oh, well, I, I, life becomes more like crossing an ice floe. Right? Um, and you're only good as your last gig. And then relationships, contracts, the contracts you have in your industry become unstable and precarious. The, I, I, I think these, 
behaviors uh, and these outcomes are, are, are all tied. And long and medium, uh, the, the medium and long term vision will can support life better and people have richer uh, intellectual, emotional and psychological experiences in life. Um, I, it's up for dispute. I, I would not, I, if Zuckerberg said, we'll swap my life with yours, just say it out. Yeah. Dude, you can you can keep your you've got your bed and you lie in it. Because for the tiny, tiny resources and money that I have, my sociological existence is is uh, sustained and it's connected and it's joyful. Interesting that you say that because um, a few years ago there was that, you know, when um, WhatsApp, I think, it just stopped working. There was a huge outcry because of that. And then the other thing that made me stop and think was when um, I think it's the guy who, I don't know whether he owns TikTok or he runs it, but the statement that he made was, I don't let my kids use this technology because they don't know all of those things because it's detrimental to their health and their life, you know, as they're growing up. And I was then I was listening to this, I was thinking, but that's not what you took into the rest of the world. You know, not many people will sit down and listen to these guys, when they actually talk about whether their own families use the tools that they are putting mm -hmm. out for our families to use. And I found that quite interesting that they're pushing this, but their kids, their families, they're not allowed to use this. Uh, absolutely. In this article here, by giving up the smartphone. You'll you find Deborah Davis's presentation. But yeah, th these damn these technologies are eroding a very cognition. You know, the dopamine farms. So, you know, a, if if we produce a, a pattern, and this was originally found uh, doctors were answering their pages. They're going, oh wait a minute, I felt that buzz. I heard it ring, but no information was coming. What what could be so powerful to cause auditory and tactile hallucinations? So there aren't chemicals, it's just a pattern of stimuli. And then you look at mixed schedule reinforcement and how mixed schedule reinforcement has been woven in, but it's also inherent in many of these technologies. And that takes up, yeah, it, it, it damages how our capacity to work in the world, because our brain is filled with these, these disrupts. Oh. I should check my phone just in case. All right? Now, if I came in when you were studying every 15 minutes and went, hiya. <laughs> yeah, yeah, eventually. Not, not, I, I'd hope you'd say, look, I'm trying, I'm trying to study. Hiya. Have you thought, have you thought that you might want to go out and see your friends later? <laughs> oh, Alex, just leave me alone. I'm trying to concentrate. And we're seeing that, that the designers going, oh no, we made this. We made these golems in the world. They're, they're acting independently. We've got a, so Google, well, there's a lot of people in Google are saying, 
don't, don't, don't put my children near these technologies because they're getting early reports, early warnings. Um, these, I, I, at a cybersecurity conference, I thought I'd th throw a, a question at, that, uh, at Chester in the room. Uh, yeah, Daniel Dresner has done some really great stuff. And, and there was a, a panel, and I, I thought, well, we know that digital technologies are causing the release of dopamine and adrenaline, noradrenaline, and these stimulate the release of endogenously, like the, the body's own opiates. And the opiates cause dissociation. From our environment, they 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 put us into a sort of trance, stupor. Uh, so I thought, oh, okay, I want to ask these people. One of one one person was from GCHQ. Have you had your first experiences of or reports of cyber psychosis yet? And the panel went quiet and looked at each other. And went, Who's going to feel this one? <laughs> Uh, and uh, this this uh, lady from GCHQ said, "Well, I'll, I'll, that's interesting. You ask that because we are finding that uh, people are going through physical withdrawal symptoms, the same you would find with heroin from immersive environments like virtual reality." And it's a big problem. And people are literally playing games until they die. These are overriding impulses that go back 200 million years to eat, mm. to sleep. Mm. And what we are now, and the, you know, the, the, the generations that are younger are, are now born into this. I remember, <laughs> I'm old enough to remember when, when it was brutal, you know, a, a typewriter was pretty cool, and Tipex, I can finally change the mistake on the page. I remember when telephones were not, like landlines in, in houses were not universal. I remember the, you know, so, so, I can remember a baseline before all of these things. And uh, yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I think we should read the emerging research and, and be aware that, all, that these are not immaterial. Yes. Does that mean? And activity is really important, but even if it is important, some apps and design were designed to make people use their time with no conscious. Because time is limited, but when apps come to a commercial one, they would like people to focus more their time in these apps. So the design would be more like um, guessing what you like, but actually you might not like it. But time just comes so quickly that you are not conscious of that. And with each update, it seems like we are solving complex steps. But in, in reality, we are weakness our own functional role. We don't know what we want. We're just choosing what they think we want. Yes. So the, our capacity to be autonomous. Yes. Uh, you know the, the very you know the very principle of consciousness itself it is is coming into question. Yes. So it, it can do harm to our health, of both our privacy mm -hmm. and what you just said, like <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true because consciousness of everything is being reloaded. We, like, I was reading something about uh, a family in Japan who were like, I think they actually set out an SOS 
and because the son just would not leave his room. And they were saying they had not seen him for almost a year. And yet he was in the same house with them. There's a, a, a clinical diagnosis of, of this. I, I, I was uh, talking to a professor of psychology who was talking about this very thing. You know, what, what happens when people have become, their whole consciousness has become divested from the real world and where people can only register something through a digital device. So you might go and see a musician and the only way it registers is by watching it on the little screen. <laughs> Uh, and it creates a, a chain of distortions from the experience. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a poor version, poor surrogate of, of a rich one. Yeah. I think there was one musician who actually stopped the concert because people were, yes. I'm right here in front of you, but you're <laughs> recording. And, you know, you just stopped and said, you know, I'd switch off those things. I'm right here. You don't need to look at it through your phone. And they had to. In the light of everything you've said, <laughs> the complexity between the environmental, the sociological, the digital, etc. And thinking about the task ahead of everybody here. Um, I'll, I'll just work into this question. So last week we were talking about Tristan Harris. Mm -hmm. I find myself in the rare position of, of um, moving back to um, where we might positively engage with apps. Right? It's yeah. not supposed to be my position, but here goes. So we have Tristan Harris talking about a more humane framework for apps. We have a, a, a growing group of coders that I'm very interested in who are now talking about green coding. So you were talking about software developers and coders and elegant coding. And I think there's something really interesting here. In the light of all of the complex things that you were talking about, um, as an app designer, what would your um, orientation be? What, what would be the key things you'd want people here to think about? Um, <laughs> well, the, the, what, what is enriching people's inherent capabilities to be in the world and to be present in the world? Um, and what is creating an obstacle to creating in the world, being in the, present in the world and, and connected with their, their immediate environments. Um, and and um, I, be careful. Be, I, I, I think it's very important to do exercises and Gerard Lanier, uh, very old head from Silicon Valley, one of the, the progenitors of virtual reality, does, does uh, evil, why to delete all your social media accounts from the Google group. But what he was saying, I think, makes a lot of sense here because you can understand a lot more when you have a variety of realities to contrast. Now, he used the example of in the in the nineteen twenties, everybody was, you know, oh well, we can drink alcohol, and everybody was drinking alcohol and driving around, and. and what needed to happen was 
some people being sober to understand the, the behavior of being drunk. If we've not got capacity to contrast where we're unmoored, where we're, we're detached from, we've become detached from reality. So we need to find exercises for reattaching. And then, you know, I'm not saying abandon all smartphones, abandon all technologies. What I'm trying to do is find ways of developing my awarenesses so I understand how I can enrich my world. What's a good technology? What's a bad technology? So being able to change our behavior, and this is quite interesting in, in relation to autonomy. And uh, if you look at the biomedical ethics, there are deep discussions on what constitutes autonomy. <clears throat> and autonomy is a very important thing for health. Um, <clears throat> so being able to change behavior is, and exercising changes of behavior expands our awareness, our consciousnesses, and it, may, it ultimately puts you in a better place to go, you know, this tool would be really good. Somebody came up with, oh, yeah, have you seen Doodle Pop? So I it's a wonderful tool. <laughs> so we all, let's, let's, let's say we all decide to meet for a cup of coffee to discuss something. Now, we've all got different calendars and you know <laughs> how, how hard it is can, sometimes even to get friends, all your friends together in one place. So somebody thought about all the different tools available and how different people were doing it. And they used their awareness to go, I think this might be the developed doodle pole. Highly recommend it to check out. And it's, it's the best tool I've found for arranging people, you know, a group of people to get into one place with so many different, different schedules. Um, so exercises of consciousness. And we can't be conscious if we've not understood something without. So here, here, here's a freaky one for people. Coffee? Anybody like coffee here? I love coffee. <laughs> and uh, a really interesting thing, uh, exercise was to give up coffee. Ooh, yeah. And I was like, oh, no, wait. But I couldn't remember the last day, let alone a week, that I hadn't had a coffee. Um, so eventually I must have uh, tried it. I gave up coffee and I was like, whoa, I've got a headache. And the University of South Carolina are talking about, well, the most addictive drug in the world is caffeine. <laughs> if you get a, a hangover when you stop coffee. Anyway. I tried it, came out the other side, and tried it again, and then I went, I still love coffee, so I'm going to and have more coffee. It's not about giving up, it's understanding what you're doing. And what I realized was, I don't like crap coffee. I've stopped drinking rubbish coffee. Even when it's the only option in my environment, I go, you know, Starbucks, pretty rubbish coffee. Um, so I will seek out better coffee, and, and my life is richer. So is, is that a helpful response? Uh, I, I, I think is it? so, yeah. 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 yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. With the tools and technologies, we can understand what they're doing mm -hmm. by doing exercises of contrast. Mm -hmm. Start. Stop, <coughs> start, stop. This, discover other people's relatives. So you're, you're doing, as, as designers, you're talking to other people and, and looking at what people are using and finding helpful in their life. And what, what was really interesting was, I was interested, what apps on your phone 
are you finding really useful? And because I was thinking, oh, well, I, I can do, you know, web development. My next step is app development. And then I realized, actually, it's a really rare thing for an app on a smartphone to be useful. So, you know, they're flitting, they're ephemeral. Um, little games like Candy Crusher has been really successful because it's doing a remarkably simple thing. But a smartphone is not tremendously useful for writing an essay. Or, but but it's, I think that's it's, it's the exploration process. It's, it's, uh, I notice you're using one of my favourite technologies, okay. pen and paper. <laughs> yeah. So to, to try different technologies, what are the different affordances? What does writing on this, with this, do that you know, word processors don't? Um, uh, and I find it produces a different quality of, of writing. Um, there's a book called The, the Shallows about, uh, and it looks at how much information you take in, how you take it in, reading from screen compared to off screen. And uh, one of the conclusions, or one, one of the points is that reading from screen, it, it, you, you take in a shallow understanding. Whereas uh, I, I often, I'll sort of get, get a paper or, or a book and I'll think, this is a really good author, oh, right, it's all meat. <laughs> so I'll buy a copy and I'll sit in the world, which is filled with people and interesting things. Um, my, my good coffee, and I'll sit and I'll scribble on the, and you can hold a book open in three different places. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's got a tactility that, that's really nice. I can, well, yeah, it, so the affordances. So really experimenting and exercising your autonomy yeah, through choice. And that there is an app to support people to do exercises in contrast. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting question and, and something that um, one of the people in our building, Mark Johnson, I think thinks about quite significantly. Oh, really? They want a conversation about that. Yes, I think he does exercises in contrast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> Right, has anybody got any more last questions? Conscious of time, we're always pushed for time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so I'm sure Alex will take questions asynchronously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if I can be helpful, uh, or, or even if you want to chat, I will buy you cake and coffee and give you my undivided attention. I think that's a really one of the most rich things that I've learned to do in this modern, fast-flowing, pushing environment, going, no, oh, actually. I can slow down time. Yeah, let's have a conversation and be present in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, not everything has to be instrumental, like, okay, well, uh, or, or have a solid idea, but certainly, you know, conversationally. Mm -hmm. or, or, or when things pop into mind. So, Drop me an email if I can be helpful, uh, and, and tell me what I'm missing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I need other people to see my my myopia. My what are my blind spots? Uh, and that's and so and you're going to hopefully join us in December in the last session where these guys are going to share their thinking and what they've done with their designs with you. So. I really look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.